Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today I want to start off with an apology for the fact that I have been gone for a few weeks. Um, I had a lot of stuff going on in my life with my family and stuff like that. So I took a little bit of a breather, uh, but that means that I had to neglect you guys and I'm really sorry for that. But I wanted to let you guys know that I also, while I was gone, did a lot of work around my house getting um, my new studio set up. So I now have a specific room in my house that's specially designed for shooting videos and editing videos. So I've got all new equipment. Um, my lighting is a little bit different. My area is different. So if you have any issues with the lighting or the sound or whatever, just let me know um, because I did get a whole new setup. Um, and uh, I should be able to put out my content a little bit more regularly since now. I don't have to move my equipment from room to room trying to find the quietest place in the house. I should just be able to come in here and, and have it already set up and ready to go whenever I need it. So um, I should be able to answer your questions a little bit more quickly and put out content more regularly. So um, thank you guys for bearing with me and thank you for coming back to the channel and watching my videos. And okay, so where we left off last time was that I gave you guys a life update about what was going on and um, it was just a really quick video. But in the video, I mentioned how my dad had just been appointed an elder. So that's something that I've been thinking about a lot more recently. Um, and I've just spent a lot of time lately thinking about the elder arrangement and why I have a pop problem with it as a whole. Um, there are different things within the organization that I take issue with. And one of the major problems that I have um, with being a Jehovah's Witness was that I never felt comfortable with the elder arrangement. So I want to talk a little bit today about what the elder arrangement is and I want to compare it to pastors and priests and other denominations religious leaders um, because I think that there isn't a lot of conversation between people who have never been Jehovah's Witnesses and people who have only been Jehovah's Witnesses about how elders differ from pastors and priests. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. If it sounds interesting to you, please stay tuned for the rest of the video. Okay, so the past couple of days I've spent with my sisters and last night we kind of got into a conversation about my dad being appointed an elder and we were talking about the whole elder arrangement and through the course of the conversation I realized uh, I guess I was able to solidify um, a lot of the problems that I have with the elder arrangement. Um, my sisters have only ever been Jehovah's Witnesses so they've never um, been any other religion so they were not aware of the qualifications that it takes for someone to become a pastor or for someone to become a priest or a minister or a reverend or anything like that. Um, so I kind of want to talk to people because I realized that a lot of you are ex Jehovah's Witnesses and you've never been any other religion. You've never been any other type of Christian. Um, you've never dipped your toes in to any other church or anything like that. So um, I want to talk about first, before I get into the elder arrangement, what it takes for someone to become a pastor or a priest. Okay, so the different terms that you hear, um, pastor, priest, reverend, preacher, any of those terms, usually the difference is the denomination. So if you're Catholic, um, you're not going to be a pastor. Um, that's reserved for specific denominations. Um, priest is reserved for specific denomination as well. Um, but it also has to do with educational requirements. So what I did was I went online and I looked up the different um, qualifications that you have to have to become a pastor or a preacher or a priest or a minister. And what I found was that by and large, every single pastor has to have at least a bachelor's degree. That's something that was across a lot of different denominations um, for a congregation to hire you to become their pastor you basically have to have a bachelor's degree and you have to have studied underneath another pastor for a certain amount of time in order to have enough experience with a congregation to be able to lead your own congregation. 
So in the United States, a bachelor's degree is usually a four-year program that you go through. Um, in order to become a pastor, the degree usually is in theology or philosophy or another related field. And um, when you're talking about priests, that's very similar because you also have to start off with a bachelor's degree as an education. It's um, usually you start off with a bachelor's, which I, like I said, is four years, and then you go on to what they call a seminary school. So a seminary school is an advanced education school that you would go to, that you have to apply to. If you don't have secular education before you go to seminary school, it's highly unlikely for you to get into seminary school, even though it's possible. But seminary school usually lasts four years. And if you get in without an education, which is very rare, they will require you to have more years on top of that, advanced years. So instead of going to seminary for four years, you might go for six or eight years instead of the regular four. So uh, after you graduate from seminary school, um, you'll be known as a deacon. And you have to be a deacon for at least six months to move on from being a deacon to being a priest. And that's usually studied underneath other priests. Um, you do uh, have priestly duties similar to being a ministerial servant. And you will be expected to deal with the congregation, council people, um, and you'll be underneath the direction of a priest in order to get some experience with the congregation. So basically what it boils down to is in order to be a pastor, you usually have to have at least four years of education, secular education. And in order to be a priest, that usually requires at least eight years of education. Um, if you're talking about moving on and becoming a reverend or um, a diocese or something like that, um, that's going to require even more education on top of that. So when we're talking about these different degrees, philosophy degrees and seminary schools, the types of courses that we're talking about are you're going to be required to have um, a lot of theology classes. So you're going to be studying religion as a whole, not just Christianity, but other religions, church history. Um, you're going to be studying language classes like Greek and Latin. Um, uh, they're also going to make you take philosophy classes and psychology classes. A lot of um, theology degrees and philosophy degrees will also require you to take counseling classes on how to become a counselor. So I know that a lot of times Job's Witnesses will equate elders with pastors and priests. But the fact of the matter is that that is not something that you really can do because Elders don't have an education. They pretty much do not hold degrees, especially philosophy or theology degrees. So all of the qualifications that you would need to have to become a pastor or a preacher or a priest fall by the wayside when it comes to talking about being an elder. Because the fact of the matter is you just don't have to have an education in order to become an elder. Okay, so the second difference I found when I was researching what it takes to become a priest and how that differs from being an elder is that um, in order to get accepted into seminary school or to become hired as a priest in a church, you have to have a background check. Um, so that is like any other job that you have to have that you might have to have a background check in. They put a heavy emphasis on um, criminal sexual behaviors. So if you've ever been convicted of rape or sexual assault, it's basically not possible in this day and age for you to become a priest because they heavily uh, regulate their background checks and they just will not accept people into priesthood that have problems with those because the Catholic Church especially has had a lot of problems with that in recent years. So the, the third thing that I wanted to talk about was that in my own personal experiences in my neck of the woods, I have um, been a member of a few different churches. And the thing that I've noticed about the churches that I've attended is that by and large, most churches, if they're of a certain size, have on staff someone who is 
legally qualified to be a counselor. So they hold a certification or licensure to qualify them to be a counselor. Sometimes the counselors are the pastors themselves. Sometimes they're counselors that are just a general counselor. Um, but if you go to a church in my neck of the woods that's of a certain size, what you'll find is that they have different counselors and different pastors that are for different problems that you might have. So one pastor might specialize in counseling in marriage. One might um, have experience counseling in addiction. Um, and they're all someone that has life experience in that area. So you're not going to find in any of the churches that are around me, marriage counseling pastors who aren't married or haven't been married for a long period of time. You're not going to find addiction counselors who haven't dealt with addiction in their own personal lives. So a lot of times when you go to these different pastors, you'll find someone who has life experience in whatever area you need it. There's youth pastors and addiction counselors and abuse counselors and all different kinds of pastors and counselors within a lot of different churches. Now, what I found is that in smaller churches, they are affiliated with an, a larger church that has those available to you, or they're affiliated with a secular counselor who happens to be a Christian and specializes in Christian counseling. So they'll point you towards a specific counseling group that you can go to. I've noticed in my own personal experience that when I've gone to pastors for advice, they are um, by and large pretty good about knowing their own limits and um, that they don't try to overstep their bounds of their own education. So if they don't have any experience in marriage counseling, they will point you towards a pastor who does or a counselor who does have experience in marriage counseling. So that's something that I found that I really thought was um much different than being a Jehovah's Witness because within Jehovah's Witnesses you might go to a particular elder for marriage counseling and unbeknownst to you he might have a difficult marriage so um, that's not really the case with pastors outside of Jehovah's Witnesses. Another thing that I've noticed is that in my town specifically they have um, of several churches that are affiliated with what they call Celebrate Recovery. In my town, Celebrate Recovery is a program that, like I said, is affiliated with multiple churches and multiple counselors and therapists um, that has to deal with um, recovering from abuse or addiction or those kinds of things. So within that group, um, you find a network of people who have dealt with whatever problem you're dealing with currently. So if you're a member of a smaller church in my town, they will point you towards the Celebrate Recovery program, which is not just citywide, it's an area-wide program that they have um, that can get you in touch with rehabilitation facilities, um, networks of people who have dealt with your problem, counselors, therapists, um, even medical professionals that can help you deal with that. So within my town, that's something that um, exists and I'm sure exists in other towns. So the next thing that I wanted to talk about is the fact that um, Jehovah's Witnesses are always really big about talking about how everybody within their organization is volunteer. And um, they say that in such a way that it makes you believe that um, there's no way people could have ulterior motives because um, they don't have any um, reason behind doing this aside from they just do it in their spare time. So uh, I have heard Jehovah's Witnesses talk about how um, they don't like that other churches pay their pastors and priests in order to um, be head of that congregation. And I think that that's misguided because what ends up happening is with Jehovah's Witnesses specifically, since they are on a volunteer basis, that means that they have to have another way to support their families. So these men that are head of the congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses, different elders and ministerial servants, they all have jobs. They all have secular work that they have to do, um, you know, 40 hour work weeks or maybe even more hours than that. They work full-time jobs outside of being Jehovah's Witnesses. 
Um, and I think the reason why um, that arrangement doesn't work out is because that ends up meaning that they have to split their focus. There's no way that you can be an elder full time and do nothing but elder work. You have to be able to support your family. You have to be able to pay your bills and, um, you know, you, you have rent or a mortgage or, um, you know, you have to pay your electricity and feed your family. So there's no way that you can um, not work as an elder. You have to have a job outside of the organization. So like I said, what that ends up meaning is that a lot of these elders have to split their focus. The second problem is that since they don't encourage secular education, especially in theology or philosophy, um, that means that they don't have any idea about anything besides Jehovah's Witnesses. And um, they're not educated in the world or how the world works. Um, they're not educated even within their own organization's history because the organization doesn't encourage people to look back on publications that are beyond a certain number of years old. So they're not even abreast of what's happened historically within their own organization. And they're not educated in other organizations, hierarchy or history either. So um, what happens is that to get appointed an elder, there aren't any specific qualifications like there are to be appointed as a priest. In order to become a priest, there's a physical number of years of education and seminary school that you actually have to attend in order to even be considered into priesthood. The same is not true of elders. There isn't a set number of years that you can become a Jehovah's Witness and follow a certain timetable and become an elder. That just doesn't happen. What does happen is that in order to become an elder, you have to have been a ministerial servant, which means the elders in your congregation have, you've expressed an interest in becoming a ministerial servant and they have decided that through whatever course of events you are allowed to, to have the privilege of becoming a ministerial servant. So the elders in your congregation would elect you into that position. You'd be appointed a ministerial servant and then the circuit overseer for your area would appoint from the ministerial pool whoever he deems worthy to become an elder. So it's really just down to one person to decide if you've proven whether or not you fit the criteria for being an elder. There is no physical number of years that you have to have been a Jehovah's Witness. There's no certain number of years that you have to have been baptized. And there are no certain number of years that you have to have been a ministerial servant. It's really all just up to the feeling of whoever is in that position of circuit overseer as to who gets appointed as an elder. So what that means is that you can have somebody in the position that basically has no life experience outside the organization. Um, these people that are appointed as elders that are young brothers being appointed as elders, young, even, you know, 20, 25 years old, um, which I think is exceedingly young for an elder position, but it's not unheard of. Um, it's feasible that they have never had um, a relationship with a woman it's feasible that they have never had an education. In fact, it's highly likely that young men that are um, elected as elders don't have any education outside the organization because that means that they have spent most of their time focusing on goals within the congregation and not education. If a young man was to go outside the organization and get a secular education, he wouldn't be considered into an elder position in the first place. The kind of men that are considered into elder positions as young men are the type of men who have spent a long time pioneering and not pursuing secular professions or secular education. So we're talking about young men who have basically no life experience because they've dedicated their lives to the organization. And also they've never had personal relationships outside of the organization. They also don't have any education or anything like that. So these young elders who are being appointed are instructing people about marriage problems or abuse or addiction when they have no basis for understanding those on a fundamental level and no education on how to counsel people in the first place. So that's a big problem that I have. Young elders is a major problem that I have. Um, 
But even within middle-aged elders, you still find a similar problem because um, you may have an elder who was appointed, such as my father, who has a very dysfunctional marriage, counseling people about how they should fix their marital issues when his marriage is fraught with issues. Um, he has no business counseling people about what they should do with their marriages considering the state of his marriage. And yet, that's exactly what's going to happen. He's going to end up counseling people on what they should do with their marital problems. And he basically doesn't have any idea um, what a healthy marriage looks like because he has been in an unhealthy marriage for so many years. So that's also a problem that I have. So basically what happens when you go to the elders for advice um, is that you're going to be counseled basically just to pray about something. Um, you're going to be counseled about reading scriptures, um, but you're really not going to be given any advice. So the problem that I have with the elder arrangement is that, like I said, in other churches, um, usually the pastors know their limits and they are quick to point you towards counselors or therapists who do have more experience in the area that you're talking about. Um, but as far as elders are concerned, they will never point you towards therapy. They will never point you towards secular counseling. Um, and so what ends up happening is that people who have no experience dealing with whatever problem you're dealing with could theoretically be counseling you on a problem that they have no experience in. Another problem is that since uh, medical information about addiction and abuse is always changing, um, they know more about mental health now than they did 10 years ago. Uh, so the advice has changed from 10 years ago. Therapists are using different techniques than they used 10 years ago. Um, but what's happening with elders is that since they aren't kept abreast of things like that because they're not encouraged to seek secular education in those matters, is that they may end up giving you poor advice based on the fact that they don't know any better. So um, sometimes the problem is I think that elders have it out for people that they're counseling. Um, so you may get someone who's really biased against you, giving you life advice, um, and they have no loving kindness for you. Um, but even if you manage to find elders who are being loving and kind and caring and do care about your situation and do have your best interests at heart, the fact of the matter is that since they're not qualified to tell you what you should be doing or to give you the proper advice, they're completely misguided. They give you advice that's contrary to current medical advice um, that they would be abreast of if they were qualified to be counseling people, but they're not. They also won't point you towards someone who's qualified. So that becomes a huge problem. What it ends up being is a lot of blind leading the blind and no one knowing what direction to go and just kind of circularly telling people that they need to pray more and that they need to study more. Um, and if it comes down to the fact that elders don't know what to do in your situation, if it's complicated and multifaceted and they don't know what to do, instead of pointing you towards someone who's qualified, what they'll end up doing is writing the branch and the branch might end up writing the governing body. But again, even the men within the governing body are not highly educated men. They're not men who hold theology degrees. They're not men who hold philosophy degrees. They're not counselors, they're not therapists, they're not psychologists, they're not medical doctors. So you have one uneducated group writing another uneducated group, writing another uneducated group on what to do with people's personal lives. And I take huge issue with that because it could be as simple as pointing you towards therapy. Someone who is qualified to deal with you medically and psychologically. Um, so again, even though they may have your best interests at heart and actually tr be trying to give you proper advice, um, it's very misguided. Um, the whole situation is just completely unhealthy um, and it's just not 
a proper arrangement, I feel like. I feel like that the, if it was arranged differently, it really could be a lot more beneficial to the members within the congregation. But I think that that's something that you find within high control groups. Um, like I said, when you go to regular everyday Christian congregations, whether it's Presbyterian or Catholic or whatever, um, those are not normally high control groups. So you do get a lot of pastors and priests and preachers pointing you towards the direction of someone who is more qualified than they are because they know their limits. Um, but within a high control group such as Jehovah's Witnesses, they don't want you seeking out information aside from what their organization puts out. So they aren't going to send you out into the world to help with your addiction or your abuse or your mental health issue. So the way that I want to wrap up this video is by telling people who do have issues with mental health or addiction or abuse to please seek help from the proper channels. I know that a lot of people who have left the organization may still have some residual guilt about going outside the organization for help, even if they might not be part of the organization anymore. Um, so I do want to encourage you to seek out the proper channels for whatever problem that you have. There are a lot of resources out in the world. Um, if you're an alcoholic, look for Alcoholics Anonymous. If you're addicted to another type of drug, seek out rehab. Um, it's not something that you can do on your own. Uh, like I said before, there's a lot of medical research that's being done now about addiction and other mental health issues. And a lot of things are coming to light. Um, there's a lot more understanding than there used to be. So seek out help. Go to a medical doctor. They may be able to point you in the right direction. Go to a counselor or a therapist. Seek help for whatever problem you have. You aren't limited to dealing with all of your problems on your own. A lot of problems you can't deal with on your own because you have been a member of a high control group for so long. So please, I highly encourage you to seek help if you have a problem. So I guess that's all I really wanted to say about the elder arrangement. Um, that is one of the major reasons why I have not gone back to being a Jehovah's Witness. One of the major issues that I take with the organization of the Watch Our Bible and Tract Society. Um, it's one of the things that keeps me from going back to being a Jehovah's Witness because I know that I won't be encouraged to seek help for the mental health problems that I do have. Um, in fact, I think a lot of the problems that people have um, come from the organization itself. So in my next few videos, I want to talk about mental health within the organization. So if you have any specific points that you want me to talk about, um, please feel free to comment below and let me know how you feel about something. Um, and also if you, if there's anything that you want me to talk about, please let me know. Also, if there's any issues with the lighting or the sound quality or something like that, please comment and let me know down below. Um, because like I said before, I have all new equipment. So, um, if there's any, um, technical issues, comment those down below and let me know that as well. Um, so in conclusion, I just want to say thank you so much for watching my video. Um, thank you for subscribing and staying tuned and I hope to be putting out content a lot more regularly. So thank you guys so much for watching and thank you for subscribing and I'll catch you guys next time.